Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we are going to take a look at an extremely rare version of a Mos Nagant. This is an Estonian model of 1935 Mos Nagant, and a big thanks to Texas Guns and Ammo for loaning me this particular rifle to film for you. Now, the backstory here is Estonia was a part of Russia. It was a province of Russia uh, under the Tsars up until the end of World War I. And rather like Finland, when the Russian Revolution takes place, when uh, Imperial Russia falls apart, Estonia takes the opportunity to declare independence. They declare this in 1918. Uh, they end up having a two-year war of independence until in February of 1920 the new Soviet Union formally recognizes Estonia as a an independent sovereign state. Now at that point, by the way going into 1918 the Estonians didn't have any standing army. Of course their military needs were uh, taken care of by Russia. Uh, so come 1920 they now need to form a military. They need some sort of state-based defensive organization. And they take a look at what small arms are in the country, and they have a mixture of four different things, which is pretty common for this area of the world at this time. They have most Nagants, this is the, the biggest batch of guns they have, and this is because the Russian troops who had been stationed in Estonia basically all had, well, largely had most Nagants. Uh, they had Arasakas that had been floating around. The Finns had, uh, had acquired a bunch of Arasakas. Some of those got into Estonia fairly early. They had German Mausers. There were of course 8mm Mausers floating around all over the place in the aftermath of World War I. And they had British model P-14 Enfields. Now the Estonians really wanted to standardize on 303, largely because the machine guns that they had in their available, in their inventory at that point, were primarily Lewis guns and Madsen light machine guns in 303 caliber. And it was the ideal solution would have been to standardize on the British P-14. Everything was in 303. The problem was they just didn't have enough rifles or enough money to make that happen. So they would try. They eventually kind of just discarded the Mausers. They didn't bother with those very much. Um, and you know some of this stuff goes to the police or prison guards or people who don't really need a standardized rifle. The army and uh, the KL, which is like the the Estonian the, the version the Estonian version of the Finnish Civil Guard, the National Guard, the Defense Union. Um, those guys would sometimes get second line uh, weapons, but. The Arasakas are as much as possible eventually exchanged for more British pattern 1914 Enfields, but the Mosin remains the most common uh, rifle pattern in Estonia. So in the early 1920s, looking at the defensive arrangements, the Estonian, the new Estonian military figures, well what we need to do is take all of these Mosins, because we've got like 80,000 Mosins, and we need to like make sure that they all work, because a lot of them are, are bad, in bad condition, they're maybe broken. And so they take the next couple of years and basically inventory, clean, and repair all of the Mosins in service. We're talking 10 or 15,000 rifles per year. The guns that are not serviceable, they strip down for parts. Um, and by about 1924, they have about half of those guns, about 40,000 Mosins, in good, actually really good, serviceable condition. Um, however, they're doing a lot of military training, and those that starts to take a toll on the guns. And by 1926 or so, like uh, they've got five figures of guns now that are not so much in really top line condition. And so something again needs to be done. And in the late 1920s, the Estonians set about developing an improved pattern of rifle because they look at the Mosin because they've got like they inherited this thing, which is too big for me to even fit all in the screen. They inherit the M91 from the Russians, and it's long, and its sights kind of suck, and they're also, by the way, graduated in Arshans, which is, you know, this archaic, at this time, archaic Russian measurement that no one in Estonia uses, and the bayonet on this thing is this gigantic pig sticker, and you put that on the end of the rifle, and now, man, you know, it's like, just, it's nuts. And by the way, the sights are zeroed with this bayonet on, which the Estonians don't really see any point for. So how do we take this and improve it? And frankly what they do at the first is look to what Finland did, and they have a program of modernizing the M91s very similar to the fin what would result in the Finnish Civil Guard rifles, the 9124s. These essentially are, uh, we're going to remark the sights in meters, we're going to improve the triggers, we're going to rebarrel them uh, when necessary, you know, basic minor sort of upgrades. We're not going to do anything really revolutionary. Um, but that's the next step. 
Uh, so they they rebuild a bunch of M91s in sort of an improved pattern, and then they start looking at how can we make this thing into actually like a better standard rifle? And once again, they turn to Finland and they, they look at what Finland's doing. Finland, of course, at this point is starting to field the M27 Army Rifle and the M28 Civil Guard Rifle. And these are dramatically shortened, they've got better sights, they're, they've got better triggers. The, the Finns in particular put a lot of emphasis on individual competition marksmanship. And the Estonians kind of look over and they're like, hey, you know, uh, can we uh, maybe take a peek at your homework over there? And the Finns not only let them take a peek, the Finns go, absolutely you can. Tell you what, uh, here's an M27, go ahead and take that, and uh, you know you can just have that one and you can copy it. And here's our uh, D bullet Patron, you know, here's our, our improved version of the Russian ammunition. Uh, you can take that, have that, they hand them over. Uh, technical details on the cartridge and the M27 rifle and some machine gun stuff, like take it, you know, do your best. And so the Estonians begin to develop, what they do first actually is they develop a marksman's rifle. Uh, the, the raw translation is like a hunter's rifle, and this is a shortened heavy barrel Mosin, much better trigger, better sights, and it's intended to go to like the best shooters in every particular unit. It's not really a sniper's rifle, it's still iron sighted, but it is a Jaeger rifle, a designated marksman's rifle. And they do that through 30, the first ones come out in 31 and 32, and there's a formal pattern in 1933, and they use the lessons of that to then develop a new shortened army rifle, and it really is in the style of the Finnish M27 or M28, and that is the model 1935. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at this guy. Everyone loves most Nagant barrel chamber marking, so let's kick this off right here. This is pretty distinctively Estonian. We have ARS, uh, which is the Estonian arsenal mark, and then 39D. That indicates that this rifle was uh, rebuilt in 1939, and it uses the Finnish D cartridge. There's a serial number on the bottom there, and honestly I have no idea what uh, the mechanism is for that serial number. They did not make 100,000 uh, or a million of these rifles, and, and I don't know how they figure out what serial number to use. It doesn't match anything else that I'm familiar with. Now moving on to some of the features here, we have a slot in the stock, very much, well obviously copied from the German uh, Mauser carbines. Um, a sling runs through this side onto this side, and then there's a buckle that holds it in place. This is a, again, a pretty common sling system for the era. The Germans did it, the Germans were very influential at the time, so the Estonians would copy it. The Finns also copied this for their cavalry rifles. If we move to the action, there's not much going on here. Still chambered for 762 by 54 rimmed, 5 round standard Mosin magazine. Um, in some of the literature there are references to improved reliability magazines, which is something that the Finns did. This appears to be a totally standard magazine, um, and it's unclear to me if the 1935 guns were supposed to have modified mags, if that was just experimental in Estonia. Perhaps this one has been replaced. Um, it doesn't match serial-wise, but um, that's what you've got going on here. We have a reinforcing bolt in the stock, which is unusual and interesting. The one other thing in the action that the Estonians did was to improve the trigger. They really didn't like the original Russian M91 triggers, that is in fact empty, um, and they wanted to improve it. They wanted to give these rifles a two-stage trigger. And remember that this rifle comes off of the lessons learned from their development of marksman's rifles. So they have a two-stage trigger here with a pretty long first stage, it's just a light take-up, and then you hit a wall right there, and then you have a really nice crisp, clean break. It's a fantastically nice uh, trigger. Something that the uh, Estonians may very well have taken some uh, clues from the Finns on. Moving forward again, we took a look at the receiver markings already, and now we have the rear sight. So on this side we have metric markings. There is a new sight base here. This is different, this is similar to, but different from the original Russian M91 sights. If we take a closer look and compare them, you can see that the Estonians reused the rear sight leafs here, uh, but they remarked them. So you have markings out to 2,000 meters on the top of that leaf. So you would move this back to an appropriate position, lift the sight up, and then that becomes your long range rear sight. You can actually see the original Russian markings are still 
on the bottom of the site, those are in Arshins, and they're kind of irrelevant. The Estonians didn't bother to scrub them off. But they did redesign the site base here, so you have a different set of notches. The Russians went every 200 Arshins, the Estonians have 100 meter increments here, and the M is for metric or meter. They continue to use Russian barrel bands, um, no handguards. Sorry, my M91 is missing its handguard. The Estonians didn't bother to put an upper handguard on the gun because they didn't bother to use a bayonet on it. Um, this will not fit an M91 bayonet, there's no bayonet lug. It's like, we, we just really don't need that. Um, they did design new front sight wings to protect their new front sight, and these are obviously very clearly patterned off of the British P14. That's the rifle that the Estonians really wanted to be using, so it kind of makes sense that they would go with that. And again, the Finns also uh, went and put nice big protective front sight guards on their rifles, where the original Russian M91s had nothing to do that. Uh, interesting to note we have a Russian style slot for the front sling swivel, or front sling dog collar here, but this is an M91 stock that has been repurposed, rebuilt, for the Estonian 1935, and this uh, is where the sling slot originally was on the M91. So they filled that with a little round plug, and then put their own slot back in place, and then reused the, uh, the metal keeper plates there. I should also point out the Estonians chose to use a standard weight most of them got barrel, so on their DMR rifles they went to a heavier barrel. They walked that back on the 1935 standard army guns. The barrel is 600 millimeters long, that's 23.6 inches, and that is exactly the same length as a Mauser K98K. So 600 millimeters was kind of a pretty typical barrel length that a lot of European powers were choosing around this time. Then it is also important to note that the Estonians never manufactured any Mosin-Nagant receivers. They also didn't manufacture bolts, or magazines, or a lot of the small parts here. They did make parts for the sights, they made barrels, because they didn't have another way to really get a hold of those. Um, but most of the small parts that, that they would need for maintenance of their, their rifle arsenal came from this huge supply of unserviceable guns that they had gotten originally you know, in 1918 through 1920. Uh, you know, when they when they take 80,000 total guns and turn those into 40,000 good good condition serviceable ones, they end up with 40,000 rifle worth of extra spare parts, and that was enough to sustain them all the way through you know production of this and their sniper models and maintenance of the regular Mosinagat fleet that they had. In total, 6,970 of these Model 1935 rifles were produced between the first prototypes in 1935 and when essentially World War II comes to Estonia in 1940. Uh, 200 of those were for the police force, the remaining 6,670 went to the army. Now in 1939 Estonia uh, receives an ultimatum from the Russians, and the, the Lithuanians, the Latvians, the Finns get the same thing. It is essentially, we are concerned about uh, German expansionist policy, and for your own good, because we're all one big family here, we need to open some Russian military bases in your country, and so you should just give us uh, permission to do that now. Like right, right now. And the Finns say no, and the Finns get invaded, and the Winter War ensues. The Latvians, the Lithuanians, and the Estonians are in a position where they really don't have the military resources that the Finns do. Um, and don't really see any choice but to accede to this Russian demand. Uh, Russia then immediately uses this access, this permission, to essentially occupy, well, they to occupy uh, Estonia. So the Estonian military ceases production of new rifles in 1940, and essentially becomes part of the USSR um, as a communist puppet state, well, communist uh, subservient state until they finally receive uh, independence once again in 1990, or in 1991. So um, these never really saw combat, there wasn't an Estonian, a formal Estonian war against Russian occupation like there was in Finland. Um, some of these probably got used with the various uh, forest resistance units, uh, movements, 
that were prevalent in Estonia during Ru Russian occupation, but uh, no formalized combat with these. So uh, They have never been imported into the United States in any commercial quantity. There are a couple of them floating around here, but they are extremely rare guns, and I have no idea what the specific provenance is of the couple that are here. But uh, fantastic to get a chance to take a look at these uh, without having to go to Estonia to find them, although that's a trip I would very much like to do, and hopefully we'll be able to do. So uh, big thanks to Texas Guns and Ammo for loaning me this particular one. I'll be sending it back to them now that this video is done. Sadly, it is not mine to keep. Anyway, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.